Welcome to the Lioness Queen Podcast. Your host, Reverend Dr. Marisha, founder, speaker, spiritual coach, and licensed minister, shares how she overcame the emotional trauma from divorce with her faith in God. Now let's jump into your daily dose of letting go of the past and living totally residue free. Here's your host, Reverend Dr. Marisha. Welcome back. Welcome back, Lioness Queens. I am so excited about today's episode. We will be highlighting another Lioness Queen this week. And I am so excited to introduce to my audience, Miss Judy Weber. The list goes on with this woman, I'm telling you, but she is an entrepreneur. She is a transformational business coach and success strategist. She definitely is a woman who loves the Lord, a woman who believes nothing is impossible. And she also has a awesome podcast that you need to check out called She is Extraordinary, which we all are. And so without further ado, I would like for Miss Weber just to share a little bit about herself and who she is and what she does to help other women. Oh, wow. I definitely can identify with dreaming big. That's something my mom instilled in me as a little girl. And I, I do it still to this day. And it's like second nature to me. So interesting how you realize your purpose early on. And so I just applaud you so much, Miss Weber, for the work that you are doing for the kingdom because it's all about kingdom build, building. And so as we always like to do on Lioness Queen podcast, we have, an- have another quote from Pierre Alex Jante. Today, we're going to have Miss Weber um, give insight on what this quote means to her. And so the quote says, the pain will come. Let it visit. Cry it out. Vent it out, bleed it out, and then ask it to leave. Do not allow it to build a home and call it broken. We aren't meant to be broken forever. That is punishment to our hearts and our minds. So Miss Weber, what, what, what kind of thoughts um, come to your mind from this quote? I have been involved in relationships that have been so painful physically, emotionally, in every way. And so I so agree with this. Like like when you've been abandoned, when you've been abused, when you've been neglected, of which I have been all three, then you've got to allow yourself to feel it and not feel bad about that, to cry that out. And for me, crying out to the Lord, Lord, why is this happening? How could I have found myself here? And what the heck's going on? But there has to be a point where you pick yourself up, brush yourself off and say, okay, Lord, help me to find the me that you see me to be, not the me that I feel right now when I've been so hurt. Because if you stay in that woe is me place too long, I think it's harder to get out of it. Going to God, because he never disappoints. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Mm-hmm. And, and having good friends that you can not just say, Can you believe what he did? But moving on instead and saying, okay, what is behind me is behind me. Now God is making all things new. I'm moving forward. So to me, that's what that poem is all about. I totally agree. And the one piece that you hinted to and talked about was that victim mindset, right? And so it's so easy to get caught up on what was me what happened to me and actually that's something I just talked about in my last my most recent podcast that is the trick of the enemy the trick of the enemy is for us to focus on what happened versus focusing on the treasure within and so let me ask this question when did you realize that there was a treasure in you that helped you through that emotional journey I was blessed to learn of Jesus at the age of like three or four. And I'm 55 almost. And so the older I get, the more I guess I rehash these old stories. My kids say, mom, you told me that 10 times already. But um, I vividly remember 
it was a Sunday night. Me and my brothers and sisters were in the living room in our small little home. And I remember mom saying, she was introducing Christ to me and my twin sister. And she said, girls, you have another brother. And before she said anything else, I said, another one? Where is he? Because I had three and I was all excited. Oh my goodness, I have another one? Then she told me about Jesus. Well, he's in heaven and he loves you. That has stuck with me all my life. Mm. When a husband would beat you or a husband would abandon you or neglect you, I mean, you have to look to the source, capital S, what really matters. You know, the one, the one who really loves you. Then, of course, you listen to songs. And I it's, called, it's called Blessings. And I, forget, I always forget who sings it. Oh, yeah, Laura's story. Yeah. You talked about the abuse. You talked about being abandoned and neglected. And sadly, there's so many women, especially right now during this pandemic, who are stuck in that right now. How did you come out of that? How did God help you to come out of that space? Because taking that first step is really challenging to do because of the fear. Talk a little bit about that. This is my very first God moment, God movement. It was my first husband and it was my high school sweetheart. But he beat me up on my wedding night. He was into drugs while I was going to college to get better. His best friend had died, so he got into the wrong crowd, and he was doing, I think, cocaine. But he never did it around me, so I I had no idea that he was addicted. He knocks me around that night. I'm like, okay, what do I do? What can I do? But I stayed for about five and a half months until God showed up big time. And here's what I mean by that. Over that five and a half months of marriage, it consisted of me being beaten, being physically, emotionally, and I was becoming a different person. I was drinking too much, too black out. It was a few days later when I could talk, I could talk about this for hours and I'm getting a little emotional. So <laughs> it was a head on crash where I survived. My mom was in the car with me. We had no seatbelts on. The odds are we shouldn't be here. And yet we survived. And the drunk who came at us at one in the afternoon we did not make it. Lots of stuff happened over that 24 hour period and what followed. It ended where I was taking a shower and I had this big gash on my cheek from the car accident. I don't even know what it was, the glass that broke or something. So I was crying in the shower. By the way, I'm, t- I'm day shy of 22. So I'm 21 years old. I had this huge gash on my cheek. And so I'm rubbing my cheek and I'm crying. And in comes my then husband. He tears uh, open the shower curtain, squeezes my cheeks together and said, shut up, you B.I. And he throws me back and I land, you know, in the tub and the water is coming down on me. And then he walked out and shut the door, slammed the door. So as I'm laying there with the water coming on me, Marisha, I still see it in my mind's eye right now. And that is when I said, oh, no, oh, no. I am not living like this. So I had a very supportive family who, by the way, did not know about the abuse because I kept it hidden. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you, when I just when I finally left him, when I got out of the hospital and all that, it's true what they say. The air smells better. Colors look clearer. The food tastes better. I didn't realize how I had changed. And it is a very scary first step. And so if I wouldn't ha- have my family and if I didn't have the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't even know what I would have done. But you've got to take that first step to get out because there's no room for that. That is amazing to me that you, what I would say, had an awakening experience. And I I truly believe we all have to have an awakening experience where that giant has to come out and realize that your God is bigger than what you're dealing with and what you're going through. And Um, I really tremendously applaud the bravery, the courage that you had to to make that first step and the fact that you had a supportive family. And I think it's so sad to say that so many of us, when we're in the situation, we don't even realize we change. We don't even realize there's an identity. There is a piece of us that we lose. As you are encouraging women, especially who have gone through what you've gone through, how did you? How do you encourage them not to lose who they are in those moments? One thing real quick I want to address, because it's really important, and that is guilt. I will never forget 
Marisha, how for years following that, now I was young, like I said, but for years following that, whenever I talked about the fact that my husband beat me, I felt guilty, like Mm -hmm. it was somehow my fault. Years later, again, I guess (laughs) through God's revelation, you know, no, Judy, you did not beg to be beaten. You did not want to be beaten. That's not why you said I do. I want to encourage anybody that's listening that's in that situation right now. And you're like, oh gosh, I want to be on the other side. How do I do it? Well, maybe he tells me that I deserve it or whatever. Ladies, that's a lie. You know, he's speaking the devil's words on that one. There should be no guilt. And I know that's a normal reaction and feeling. So don't feel bad about feeling guilty, right? We are more than conquerors through Christ. And so that's what we cling to. We are more than overcomers. Like God will get us through it. And and we are not who we were. That will not identify you. That will not be who you are going Mm -hmm. forward. Part of what I coach in my clients, which as I mentioned, are all Christian women is I say, you know what? I firmly believe that if you fully embrace who you are in Christ, when you ask him to show you how he sees you, only then can you step into your purpose. Only then will you do that scary thing that you think you're not equipped to do, but by the way, God prepared you for it. And, you know, step into that full potential. I have no doubt that so many of us, and I fear it's going to be me too, um, you know, we're going to get to meet Jesus one day and he's going to say, oh, I had all this for you, but you didn't take a step. You held back. You didn't trust me. So when I'm telling my ladies, look, as Christians, we should be the most joy-filled, the most successful, the most optimistic entrepreneurs out there. You know, I mean it with all my heart and soul. It's so sad to say that his wiles, his trickery that he plays on our mindset is so heavy. You know, you talked about guilt Um, And that's one of the things that the enemy tried to use with me in my uh, first marriage as well, because it uh, it took a while for my ex to marry me. We dated nine years first and then, you know, we got married. And that was something that he kind of brought up to me. You know, it's like, well, really, you know, he really didn't want to marry you. You know, it's interesting how the enemy does that. And so that's the only game he has. I mean, he did it with Eve way back in the day and he's still doing the same trickery unfortunately it plants a fear and that fear allows us to go down this tunnel of negativity and it's so hard to get out of especially after you walk away or after the separation and so tell us a little bit about once you made that first step like how was that emotional roller coaster for you um, in order to move forward where the Lord was leading you? I was working at Macy's at the time. It, my favorite store, my favorite store. I just had to say that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm a 22 year old one lady, so I work hard and then I play hard. I went out and danced. And, you know, to me, I still love dancing. I love music I just love you know that's that was my exercise people actually when I went out dancing thought I was like an aerobics instructor because I just would stay in sweat they're like oh you're not going to find a guy like that and I'm like that's good because I'm not looking I'm having fun right now I'm just dancing so but um so I guess through those the first year I threw myself into my work and um into my friends and really you know built that up until I got promoted to management. And then I went to outside sales. This is so interesting how God brought all this to me. And then ultimately I worked for a company called Dictapro. And so I worked um, selling dictation equipment to lawyers. And so one Friday afternoon, I I have a good memory. I remember this too. I walked out from this, you know, this appointment with this guy and I walked out and I said, oh my gosh, that guy's, I don't mean to be mean, but I said this, I said, that guy's an idiot. If he can go to law school, I can go to law school. I'm doing it. And so the rest is history. And I think, you know what? If God would not have, you know, I guess he was trying to get my attention before the car accident. But when he saw that I was going down a long road, he's like, okay, here it comes, little girl. I'm going to show you. So, but for that, I'd probably be dead. So here I was, I actually went to law school and I, and here I am today. So you really just have to take it one step at a time and not 
worry too much about what's coming far down the road. Just like Abraham, you know, God's like, you're coming this way. Oh, where am I going? Don't worry, I'll show you the way. That's so, that's such a good modeling for us. Sometimes us as women do that as well. You know, we look back like Lot's wife, even though that's not where the Lord wanted us to be. Was there ever any moments that you remember that you did look back? My second husband is the father of my boys. We were together for 15 years, but we got divorced when he got into pornography and when I felt like I couldn't be, even though I knew Jesus all my life, I feel like I really finally was saved. I know this sounds weird, but as I think about it, I don't know that I was saved until I hit my late 30s, early 40s, when I realized that all these Bible stories apply to life every day. It is not a Sunday thing, and it is not a emergency call to the Lord. It is an everyday walk. And so um, I didn't even look back with that marriage. I, I mourned it. I begged him to, you know, do work with counseling. And believe me, I will always say it was a 50-50 fail. I used to say it was a me 5% and him 95, but then I grew up and God talked to me. Mm-hmm. So but even then I did not look back because when, you know, we try for eight years to get something going and he's just going further down the bad road, I, I had to pull my boys out of that situation before it would have impacted them. That was my thought. Yeah, that personal relationship, I, I truly believe it it matures the older we get. If we want it to mature, right? And I, I do believe that the Lord also pulls us in closer if we want to draw closer. And sometimes situations happen in order for that pull, that tug within us, whether we hear the call or not. And so it's so amazing that you heard the call, you took heed to the call which has really shaped you in a way to your ministry and what you're doing with women right now. And so the question is, how do you, how do you help women get to that point of hearing the call? Especially, you know, I always say sometimes we also have to realize our faults. We have to realize our weaknesses. We have to realize our issues our baggage that we're bringing to the table as well because it's so easy to point the finger it is so easy to blame the other person but how do you help women look at that i guess it's as easy as looking at christ Mm. it's like peter's walking on water and as long as he looks at the lord he's good second he looks away he's drowning when i work with my clients sometimes our sessions you know our business coaching sessions can get emotional because our business is kind of an extension of us. And so I always say, if there's an issue with your business, look inside. Like if your business is unorganized, I guess that you're unorganized. And if your business is up and down, I'd imagine that you've got stuff going on. So, you know, I, I just always want to encourage women to, it all goes back to how does Jesus see you? Did he, you know, he made you a strong, powerful woman we're not given with the timidity or fear, but we're given a spirit of power. And so that's what I speak into them. And and I, it's an amazing thing, Marisha, to see your clients go from, you know, not so confident to even bold, you know, over time and over years, because you have to really step in to be yourself. I will tell you only in recent months, Marisha, am I feeling like I'm even approaching who I really am, like stepping out and speaking my truth. And really, I don't want to offend anyone. But at the same time, I need to speak what's true for me and do it boldly. And so that's what I always encourage, you know, my clients to. On the point about guilt that we said earlier, I can't tell you how guilty I was leaving the the father of my children. Is this is this something a good Christian woman does? Am I doing the wrong thing because you know god hates divorce so that was a whole thing and you know i think one of us has to go through that whole thing um with the lord and figure that out for ourselves but you know realizing our weaknesses my goodness our weaknesses we can only just grow we're all like works in progress (laughs) so we we got to give ourselves grace that we so readily give to our girlfriends we do. We, we do. I had a lady who reached out to me who, you know, she's recently divorced from a pastor and she was shamed so bad from the church. 
it's really sad how we can fall into that area of shame especially when we're when we have a position and then it's also where it's like you are ostracized from something that was your family something that was home something that you nurtured and loved and then all of a sudden you're an outcast and so it's so sad you know even in the church that sometimes it's not even a safe place how do you encourage women, you know, who may be in that space? Well, it's interesting that you say that because a good friend of mine was married to a pastor and she was not physically, but emotionally battered, beaten. And it's amazing how, you know, he was the pastor, so she was the bad guy. And like you say, she was ostracized. She had to come back to herself because she was so changed. That's where with this whole pandemic, we're so isolated. And there is stuff going on behind closed doors, which is enough to make everybody, anybody just cry their eyes out, you know? Isolation is the devil's handiwork. When we're <laughs> alone with our thoughts mm-hmm. and we just ruminate over these crazy, you know, oh, I wonder what she thinks of me. I wonder what he thinks of me. You know what? Don't do that to yourself and know that it doesn't even matter. Like, like when I was saying about coming into my own, Marisha, I, if somebody doesn't like me, I feel badly, like, sorry that you don't like me, but I can't, like, spend more than that amount of time on it because I can't make someone like me if they don't like me. So by that same token, once you've been hurt, you know, and, and you think people might be gossiping about you, that's on them. Gossiping is a sin. And we don't know what's going on in somebody else's life. We shouldn't be judging and Mm -hmm. all that if somebody's doing that to you you have to say lord please take it and help me to not feel that because i truly i don't know what it is i i block that like unintentionally like i don't know if, if subconsciously i just do it but i don't let that penetrate that is what the enemy wants to do he wants to penetrate that subconscious so we go down that tunnel and we never come out of it. it it just takes root you know like a stronghold And so for you to be able to block that out is so amazing when there's so many women, sadly, who struggle in that regard and they struggle with comparing themselves and they, they, and then, then it, then it, it's like the enemy gets them to compare and then the enemy gets them alone. And so with those two things that they go down this rabbit hole of thoughts when, when they don't realize that they are never alone. Like God has always been there. God is there. You know, God knows the amount of uh, hairs that are on their head. God realizes every tear that comes out of their, their, their eye ducts, you know, but, but it is all about that isolation and comparison that makes women build up this block and this wall and they and they they don't allow the lord to really come in and so when you talk about how you you felt like you have evolved um and 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 your personal relationship has grown so much to the point where you now realize what god has placed you here for i'm telling you is so powerful and so that is I I truly believe that is the work that you're doing. You are literally trying to help women get to that place of realizing the treasure within and realizing the gifts that they have for the kingdom, you know? And so how do you, I truly can map this out in my life. Um, How do you help women map out that all things work together? Because oftentimes We feel, especially with divorce, especially with that loss, we feel like they messed us up, that they destroyed my future. So how do you, how do you help women in that regard? That goes back to being good and okay with who you are in Christ. So one thing that, why I'm very open with my backstory of my abuse and my failed marriages is because I don't want someone to look at me and see this put together woman 
<laughs> even though she's getting more wrinkles by the day, but this put together woman who goes live on Facebook regularly, you know, she goes live on Instagram. She's always got a smile on her face. You know, she must have been born with a silver spoon in her mouth. She didn't have any worries, any cares, this and that. I want them to know where I come from to be a testimony and an example of, I don't care if the man did horrible things to you. Um, you cannot let that stop you from doing big thing. And in fact, doing what God wants you to do. See, that's what we need to seek out and say where God calls you to it, he will equip you in that. So the fact that I am where I am right now in my life and in my boldness and in my work, which is just, you know, I've never been more joy filled in my work and more solid to know this is exactly where God wants me right now. And I think for the rest of my life, but until I got there, it was, you know, a lot of hesitation. It was a lot of doubt and fear. And now I still have that, but I still move forward anyway in the fear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's one of my main mantras. It's like, mm -hmm. do afraid and don't wait until you're ready. Just figure it out. Just take the next step. Mm -hmm. When I was listening to your episode 35 and you talked about perfection. And so that is the piece. Like God doesn't need us to be perfect. He loves our inadequacies. He loves that about us. And so that's the piece where when we look at other women and we think that they have it all together, no, we all have flaws. And it's okay for our flaws to even show. It is okay for us to admit certain things because we aren't perfect. Because if we were, we wouldn't need the Lord. We are weak, but in Him we are strong. Strong. And so the weaknesses, I readily admit, like I said, thank God that I've come to the revelation where, you know what, I shouldn't point fingers at my ex-husband, the father of my children, because I was far from the perfect wife. But I'm a much better wife now. And like you say, there's no perfection. We, we do the best we can under the circumstances that we have mm -hmm. and just um, look to him to tell us the next step and just do our best and look to him to strengthen us. Oh my goodness, how many times a week do I say Lord strengthen me I am tired I didn't get enough sleep or hey Lord please Lord if you would please speak to me what should I be doing here or there in my business or in my life I mean it's that constant conversation and um, you know relying on him really mm -hmm. it's not about me it really isn't I'm just a vessel yeah that's the piece it's not about us that right there is key even in the things that we experience good bad or indifferent it's our story, but it's all for his glory. How did your children process the divorce? My parents divorced when I was in middle school. I remember, you know, and in how I internalized my mother's hurt. It's so interesting how kids' perspective on things. How did your children handle that? So they seem great, right? I mean, me and my boys have always been super tight. And it's so neat. My two oldest boys, they're in the ministry. My my older son, he just got his first job after graduating college in May, last May. And he's working in Chicago as a worship pastor. And my middle son just finished his junior year at Liberty University. He wants to be a pastor. And my third son, he loves the Lord, but he doesn't feel called to the ministry. So it's neat that when I came to Christ in my late 30s, early 40s, that's when I was really living it out, and that's when I'd always taken the boys to church with me. Church was something that I felt we needed to do, but now it's not a checkbox. It is a, I can't wait to hear from the Lord kind of thing. So they were raised in Christ. They knew they could always count on me, so I thought they were great. Well, years later, my older son, who is the leader of the pack, you know, he's the most vocal, and he's like, you know, Mom, that divorce was hard. Why wouldn't you tell me in the moment? And he's like, well, I mean, it was just weird. I hated, you know, every other weekend going to see dad. And, you know, I loved you both. And I kind of felt torn and it just wasn't cool. I knew it was better because you guys were fighting all the time. But still, my kids grappled with that and they never told me. And I'm the type of person, I think you can hear it in my voice. I'm like an open book. Hey, guys, how are you doing today? You know, is everything okay? And their grades were still good. And there was no weird, you know, issues that arose, thank God. But yeah, I mean, they struggled. And I have to say, for me, growing up, 
my parents fought all the time. I remember begging my mom to just leave my dad and because I was so tired of the yelling. So for me, it's kind of like me and my twin sister, we were the babies. There were many years between us and the next sibling. So it was just us two in the house. And I remember we're like, boy, I wish they get divorced. I just wish they get divorced. And so and then my boys are like, well, we didn't want you to get divorced. We kind of sort of thought it was best. But anyway, long story short, it was more difficult for them than I realized until years later. Yeah, that's, that is the piece that we always have to check in on to see how our children internalize it. Because they do. I don't like how parents use the children in a way to hurt the other parent. And it's so sad because we don't know how to deal with our hurt. My ex-husband and I, I feel like we became better friends than we ever were as husband and wife because the kids were always the priority. So I, I had written it up in the agreement that whether it was my weekend or his, I would pick up the kids and take them to church because he wasn't going to church and he was agreeable to that. So. I think there was very little, if any, of that, although I know that's pretty common. You know, I put my kids first, and Lord knows I've made mistakes, but they have always been my focus because I had such loving and giving parents, so they modeled that for me. They sacrificed everything. What advice do you have for the listeners who are still in that rabbit hole? They are still um, struggling trying to take that first step. Don't hesitate to reach out to friends. And if you're saying, well, I don't have friends or family, then you cry out to God every every minute you can. Lord, help me find a way out. Lord, help me find the next step. I mean, he will reveal it, but you do have to, it's going to be a scary thing. You do have to take that first step. I know full well that depending on the circumstance, that could be a very, very scary thing. Very scary, like threatening you know, physical harm type thing if you leave. I mean, it's hard. feel like you almost can't do it alone or it's very difficult to do it alone. You've got to find a friend, somebody that you can lean on, that can help you plan your exit, especially if you're in a situation where, you know, you're you're concerned for your physical well-being, you know, like a restraining order which when you're married, I don't know how you can do that secret. But, you know, as a lawyer, of course, I've got to say that. If, if someone's hurting you, get that restraining order. And I know that there's so many issues. This is so complex, Marisha. There are so many variables. But leaning into the Lord, sometimes I picture myself sitting on God's lap and leaning into his chest and saying, like being his little girl, saying, okay, Lord, tell me, help me, hug me, hold me, and please tell me what I'm supposed to do. Our time is gone, but I want to send a big thank you to Judy Weber, who gave her testimony. She provided words of wisdom, and I truly believe that we, Lioness Queens, you aren't alone. You know, there are other women who have gone through the same struggles that you have gone through. And so do not be afraid to reach out because reaching out is the first step. You know, there's so many resources Like she said, there's so many advocates, there's so many agencies and programs um, out to help women, especially women who have um, experienced domestic violence. And so do not be afraid. Do not allow the enemy to use trickery and false narratives to really implant negativity into your subconscious to the point where you build up that wall. You know, you have access to the Lord. You um, are the apple of his eye. You are an overcomer. You are more than an overcomer. And so God is so into you. God loves you so much. And there's so many other women who have overcome um, what you are going through. And so it definitely is the words of our testimony that can break down those walls. And so, you know, that is why there's so many women out there who aren't afraid, just like Miss Weber, who who they're they're not afraid to share their testimony because they were in your shoes, that they were in that same place that you are in right now. And they trusted the Lord. They gave everything to the Lord. They totally became naked in front of the Lord and surrendered. And so be encouraged, my sisters, 
be encouraged because you can do all things through Christ. We think in our weakness that we can't do anything, but in our weakest points, that is when the Lord steps in and gives us hope for the future. And so again, I'm so appreciative. So always at the end, Miss Weber, I always like to do a chant and I'm so excited to, to have someone to do this chant with me. I want you to repeat after me. I am a lioness queen. I am a lioness queen. God wants me to rise up. God wants me to rise up. He wants me to take my rightful place. He wants me to take my rightful place. As the queen I am. As the queen I am. He wants me to be residue free. He wants me to be residue free. Intentional in my fight. Yes, God wants me to be intentional in my fight. Stand on the word of God. Stand on the word of God. Realize I am a masterpiece. Realize I am a masterpiece. I am. I am. I am. I am. I am enough. I am enough. I am a lioness queen with a purpose. I am a lioness queen with a purpose. Amen. 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 Thank you, Marisha. for joining the Lioness Queen podcast. Please subscribe and write a review. You can find me on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and even iHeartRadio. I would love to hear how this message empowered you. Come back next Tuesday at 3 p.m. for more from your Lioness Queen.